Mr. Timmermans, now that you're seated down, I want you to give us your impression, uh, your feelings after what you've seen. I know that you're very committed to the question. Uh, you've said some very moving things, in fact, some of which I've heard about European values, uh, the need for tolerance. You've said diversity is humanity's destiny. But things keep getting bad and worse and worse. The news every day is terrible. Your thoughts, please. Well, first of all, um, for some time now, uh, the determining factor in European politics has been fear. Um, and you know it's a psychological fact that if fear dominates, um, people go looking for confirmation that their fear is justified and are not open for um, elements that would counter that fear. So what you see across Europe is, is the politics of fear being exploited by certain political uh, um, movements uh, and we gave that space to them because we as politicians of the middle of the center abandoned a speech based on our values we became um, too practical about things we, we started talking in terms of practical solutions like engineers instead of politicians and that created a situation where those who, who cater on fear have become ideological, are, are talking about values, their values, which are not my values, but we don't have a clash of values in this debate. We have, especially the extreme right, um, uh, you know, advocating uh, Europe to go back uh, to the 1950s, portraying a past mm. that never was as a sort of a, a alluring future that, of course, because the past never was, will never be. But still, they take people to, to a place where their fears are catered to instead of giving them hope that we can uh, find solutions. And that, that, I think, today is, is our biggest challenge. Combined with that is the, um, the move to try and dehumanize mm -hmm. refugees mm -hmm. by, by saying, mm, they're not real refugees, they're economic migrants, or by saying, um, well, some of them are jihadis, so let's keep all of them mm. out. Uh, and, and as long as you can, can make sure that our citizens see the human being behind the refugee, we'll be all right. Uh, and that is why I so much like the exercise just done. You know, if, if, if politicians would speak about refugees in terms of what would you do if you were in the same situation, then I think we could, we could win this debate. But if we, we keep talking about them as asylum seekers, uh, uh, people looking for a better future, uh, people playing games, people not playing by the rules, <laughs> then we take away part of their humanity mm -hmm. and give reason to those who don't want to face the, the problem by saying, let's close the borders and keep everyone out. Absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's about humanity. It's about people. In fact, popular, popular support, public support has been quite strong. Uh, though, of course, there are extremist elements as well. So thank you for your response, Mr. Timmons. Uh, Monsieur Damignon, you have a question for Mr. Timmons as well. Yes, the first thing I would like to do is to commend uh, the Commission and the uh, President and the Vice President for having clearly brought the Commission back to center stage. The responsibility of saying things, promoting things, and seeing what the reactions are. And I think this is necessary and bold. Why bold? Because I have never seen a situation where member states are so distrustful one from the other. Going back to the, there was always a degree of rivalry. But at the end of the day, there was a complicity to achieve a number of very specific goals which have been attained. And I think that is the second point which we have to restore pride in our strategy. We've lost pride. We mustn't boast about what we've done, but we must not be ashamed about what we've done. We've done extraordinary things. And I believe it would be interesting, A, to see if uh, you, you share that, that analysis both of the need and of complication and how all of us can contribute to the result. Well, I think two fundamental challenges we face 
is, first of all, that at all sorts of levels in our society, um, uh, it's not just pride we've lost. I'm, I, I could do without pride, but mm -hmm. a certain measure of self-confidence mm -hmm. would be useful. Uh, we have no self-confidence uh, whatsoever. Uh, and this happens at all levels of our society. Um, no self-confidence that Europe can face the future, especially in the middle classes in Europe, that they will not be faced only with decline, uh, because that's the biggest fear that's driving, you know, the uh, political developments are driven from the middle, always, in a, in, in a society like the European society. Not bottom-up, not top-down, it's radiating from the middle, and the middle lacks every self-confidence, because people, for the first time since the Second World War, arguably, now feel in the middle that their children might be worse off yeah. than they are today, and that creates a certain uh, attitude yeah. of lacking self-confidence, and this permeates in all our political structures, obviously. Um, and the second problem, which, which is a more day-to-day -day problem for people in my position, is that there is um, uh, quite a strong lack of trust between member states. Um, and this, of course, happened during the uh, financial crisis. Um, uh, look at the... Uh, um, Stability Pact, that was the first demonstration of a lack of trust. We have an agreement, but some uh, states are more equal than others uh, when it uh, comes to applying the agreement. Um, uh, we need to get out of this, and uh, uh, this whole debate we've seen in the last five to six years of southern, some southern Europeans portraying the north of Europe uh, uh, as um, sort of neo-Nazi misers who don't want to see that uh, austerity is just killing everything, and in Northern Europe, people portraying people in Southern Europe as too lazy to work and retiring at 50 and spending all the time at the beach uh, drinking ouzo. Complete caricatures of each other that have fed into the public debate and the political debate, and now we don't trust each other. I mean, just look, one simple example, one practical example. Just look at the conclusions of the European Council. Compare the conclusions of the European Council today with the conclusions of the European Council, let's say, 15 years ago. Every element of unclarity now needs to be negotiated at the highest level so that not one word could be construed in a different way. That's a manifestation of distrust between member states. You no longer have general conclusions because no, you want to be sure mm -hmm. that what you agree is what you agree and nothing more, nothing less. So I think what we, if politicians at the highest level demonstrate such a lack of trust in each other, how do you think the population will react to that? And we are back in a situation in Europe where we've lost track of what we share or uh, the common destiny we should be building. And we're looking again, especially at the differences between us. And this is an old European, uh, uh, European illness that whenever we're in trouble, we go look, look for scapegoats, we go look for differences, and we lose track of what is really important. Mm. So it's not just a policy crossroads, as we say in our program, but it's also an identity crossroads that Europe is facing. Well, I think we're in an existential crisis on, on the different levels, and this is arguably the first time in my professional life that I think we're talking about the very, the very future of the project, not about the content or elements, but I think we, the, the, ex, the challenge to the European project today is existential. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to sound alarmist, but I think it's... The refugee crisis has brought that, that to light. You know, what was ima unimaginable before now becomes imaginable, imaginable, namely the disintegration of the European project. It is no longer just uh, something uh, uh, people write about in science fiction. Those are somber words indeed, uh, Mr. Timmermans. I'm going to open uh, the conversation because there are many people here who have uh, specific questions to you. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to ask our team, uh, Debate in Europe team, to please put, uh, put up the video that we, the recording we did with Alan from Estonia. He has a question for you, Mr. Timmermans. <laughs> So Alan from Estonia has a question which I think is about a real problem facing Europe. It's about young people and their role in society. Here we go. I want to ask you a question about politics, really. Uh, we know that populist parties are gaining more and more votes, and it's often due to the fact that 
European Union is distrusted among its citizens. Young people are especially concerned here. So what will you do to make sure that more information, more actual information is given out to citizens, especially to young people, so that they can participate in politics? Well, actually, he's, he's from a country where, and I, I, I want to salute the president of that uh, country who's, who's with us uh, today. Um, he's from a country where the trust in Europe is extremely high. Why? Because they have such a vivid memory uh, of what it is to not be able to mm. uh, be master of your own destiny and to be under occupation for so long. So the, the, the belief in Europe is very strong. Now, I believe that... The European idea, the European ideals, still has very strong support among the population. Across Europe, what does not have strong report is European politicians and European politics. And, and so, uh, you know, if, you want to, if you're, you're more pessimistic in nature, you look at the last element. If you're more optimistic in nature, which I think is an obligation of politicians to be, you would look at the first element. So we have something to work with, namely... The belief that Europe is still something that could be um, a, a, a positive contribution to our, to our future. Now, how do we then fix politics? And I'm sorry, it's not about communicating Europe. Um, it, that's been done. It's right, you know, it's, sometimes I feel, especially in the organization I now represent, that we still believe that you know, it's like when you meet somebody who doesn't speak your language. You say something to the person and they react sort of blank with a blank face. So your first impulse is to say the same thing but slowly and louder. Mm. Uh, but if they don't speak your language, they won't understand what you're saying. And I think this has been the communication strategy of the EU for too long. <laughs> um, so we need to be uh, there where the people are. Not talking about, about the general elements, but about the values we represent and why it is necessary that we find European solutions to European problems such as the refugee crisis. Uh, and not just, you know, propaganda fide will not work. Uh, we tried, it doesn't work. But if we are, like we're trying to do as a commission now, if we, are, if we are leading on policies, if we're leading on setting the agenda, if we're leading on showing that we can actually perform, then perhaps we will be convincing uh, to young people. One more uh, remark about young people, which is something I worry about a lot. Um, we have now, in Europe, the healthiest uh, the best educated, um, the, the best um, uh, networked um, uh, generation in our history. So that is a very, very good starting position. But what I also see is that they lack some of my generation's capability of organization, of getting this organized. Because sometimes the feeling is that if you put it on Facebook, if you say it on the internet, that's uh, 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 yeah. well enough. But, you know, society needs more structure and organization if you really want to change things. And my biggest worry about the youngest generation is that, like we are doing here a bit today, I'm sorry to say, is that they all stick together with people who already agree um, with their own social group, in their own ethnic group or social group, etc. And there is less and less contact with other groups. I can even quote my own family, my two oldest children, live in completely different social contexts, and they have, they have different worlds. They have different worlds, different ideas, and it's becoming more and more difficult to make sure that there is solidarity between these groups. And that is what is ailing, I think, European society, that we are, we are sort of getting into silos, different silos of people who live the same lives, and that there is less and less understanding for people who live different lives either on ethnic grounds, social grounds, economic grounds. And, and if we want to recreate a, a political Europe, we have to make sure that these silos uh, don't develop further in, in society. All I'd say to that, uh, Mr. Timmons, you're absolutely right, but these silos tend to be global silos. Yes, oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, it, so. Unfortunately, it's not just a European problem. That's right. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open uh, the floor to all of us here. We're going to have a conversation, Mr. Timmons. I'm going to take one question at a time, put it to you, and I'm going to make a plea, brutal plea, if I may say so, for brevity and getting to the point very quickly. We don't want, at this point, any long uh, declarations or comments. Just, we have Mr. Timmermans here, actually till 10.15. Uh, he has to leave then. So let's make it quick and snappy, and I'm happy to start taking questions. Please identify yourselves. I know most of you, but 
Uh, Mr. Timmermans may not. Uh, so please, who's uh, ready to go first? Yes, put up your hand, of course, if I don't see you putting up your hand. So I have Jim Clarkin first, please, and then I'll go to you. Yeah. Yes? Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Clarkin from Oxfam. <clears throat> I'd just like to challenge the narrative a bit here, and uh, I suppose going back to your point, uh, we're very happy to be in this room as Oxfam, and uh, unlike your, you know, we wouldn't normally be in a gathering like this, so I think we are mixing it up a little bit, and it's uh, much appreciated by the Friends of Europe that uh, have given us space to, to be part of these important dialogues. Um, I, I think this, all this talk of a refugee crisis in Europe is actually inaccurate. Um, a few hundred thousand people trying who are desperately fleeing conflict and, and certain death in many cases, um, coming to the wealthiest place on the planet of 500 million people isn't a crisis. Um, when you have one million people going to the Lebanon and, and a quarter of the entire population being, having refugee status, that's a crisis. So I, I think that... Jim, you'll have to... I'm sorry to break brief, in, but okay. you have to be very, very brief. Very, very quickly. I, I think... What we need to see, the, the public have been miles ahead of the political establishment right. here. They, they have shown their own leadership. And what we really need to see now is, is a bit of courage, <laughs> knowing that those people are behind the leadership, are behind this movement, are, are, are interested in supporting, yeah. and have the, stretch out that humanity and talk about the Europe that, that we have all believed in, that we're, we've all been part of, we've all benefited from. Right. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Timmermans. Um, I'm afraid, well, well Apparently, we don't, we don't agree. I, I think Ox Oxfam will have a problem with its own constituents, um, like any organization in our society has a problem with constituents. Um, we all have that. Um, um, that's my first remark. Um, secondly, apparently, you only see what you want to see, I'm sorry to say. Um, Mr. Orban's policies in Hungary are supported by more than three quarters of the population. Um, so this leadership you're talking about is not something that you see in all parts of European society. Neither do we see it in those countries who are still, um, I think um, I'm a great admirer of Mrs. Merkel's leadership, uh, but you see how much trouble she gets into with her in her own party and her own society for doing this. So I wish it were true what you're saying, that the population is supporting politicians all going uh, that way, but I'm afraid uh, that's not the reality in, in European uh, uh, society. That being said, I still believe that if we have the courage, and I think the Commission is, is not to blame in this, I think we're, we're trying, have the courage to only talk about refugees as human beings. You will relate with the people in the European public. They will, but we need to prove that we have instruments to get this under control because the problem people have across Europe with the issue is not the amounts of people coming now, but the fear that more millions will come and that we don't know how to handle this. And frankly, we don't if we don't change some of our policies. We will have to find ways of handling this. And then, of course, let me just mention in, in, in uh, at the end, uh, the elephant in the room, Islamophobia is a big deal in this whole thing. Uh, if you look at the numbers we're receiving today and you compare them with the numbers we had in the 90s, it's only half of what we had then, but that is neither here nor there for people because they fear the nature of the people coming, uh, bringing their, what they see as their ideology. So the public debate in Europe has been poisoned over a decade with Islamophobia, and now, you know, this is, this is something that people have put in their minds. You know, I see it in my own country. Oh, well, my, my daughter's going to be raped if all these people come here. I mean, that's the sort of thing that has been created in European society, and we need to face that as well. Mm. Um, well, thank you, for, uh, thank you for being very blunt on that. And actually, I was at that fundamental rights colloquium that you held uh, earlier this month where you put anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together. And I thought that was a great, great initiative. So I'd like to really uh, compliment you on that. I had a question uh, for here from the left, please. Yes, please. Uh, bonjour. Je m'appelle Daniel Costello. Je suis l'ambassadeur désigné uh, du Canada uh, à l'UE. Je viens d'arriver il y a cinq semaines. I, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Vice President, for your lucidity and for putting your finger on this, this point about no self-confidence to face the future. I'll be very brief and say, look, I've, I've got four sisters and I've seen existential crises. Sometimes, you know, in one case it had to do with a messy divorce, in another it had to do with a bad haircut. Pardon me if it sounds like a pep talk, but my question is about the role for external partners who can't stand to see you do this to yourselves. I don't wish to diminish the, 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 the gravity and the magnitude of the problem, 
but uh, you know, what do we do as individuals when we're lacking self-confidence? We talk to our friends and our family, and we are your friends and your family, and, and, and we want to scream because uh, we trust in you, we admire what you've achieved, we don't want to see you turn inward on yourself in the equivalent of run upstairs and close the door to your room. Uh, we need you. We want you to appreciate what you've I achieved. You have to be briefer than that. I'm, and congratulations, by the way, on we're, the... We're facing global strategic challenges together with an right. assertive Russia and a rising Asia. How can we, your partners, uh, in, in practical ways, help you through this? Yes. Uh, that's, that's my question. And congratulations on the election of uh, Justin Trudeau, by the way. Uh, yes. Mr. Timmons. Um, yeah, one of the most likable people I know uh, has just won the elections in Canada. Um, which, I think, which I think is one of the elements of, of hope uh, and positivity that we could uh, arguably use in Europe. But let me be very concrete. One of the answers to this refugee crisis is a global resettlement program of a much larger scale than UNHCR is operating today. And there the European Union could do much more with much higher numbers only if countries like the United States and Canada and Australia and all the others in the Western world would join us in that effort. Um, if you just imagine you could resettle over a million people a year, you would take out the smugglers, you would take out all this human misery of people um, swimming across frozen rivers, etc., etc., you know, or freezing rivers. You, you need really to... to take another look at the measures that are already there in, in principle, but that we're not using to the full extent. So just very concrete answer to your concrete question. Why not have a global conference on resettlement and then go to real numbers in resettlement and not just 10,000 or 20,000 for a whole continent? Mm. Thank you. Uh, Mario? Mario Monti, please. Um, like President Avignon, I congratulate the Juncker Commission and yourself, Vice President Timmermans, for regaining central ground and driving force in the European process. This was uh, uh, essential and apparently it has come. Uh, you defined uh, uh, the role of the Commission with uh, three little words which are key. You said leading on policy. As you know, many in Europe wanted, and now apparently got, a more political commission. But also many national leaders interpret a more political commission in the sense of it being more open also to political pressures from national governments as regards the exercise of the enforcement functions of the European Commission. Uh, I would add that uh, for all its uh, advantages, I'm not sure that the communication of the Commission on Flexibility uh, helped uh, to uh, encourage governments to stay rigorous. Uh, and uh, uh, my last uh, observation is uh, uh, we have uh, uh, witnessed, uh, um, perhaps as a response to a more political Commission, an unprecedented degree of uh, insults from national leaders to, not to you or President Juncker, but to the bunch of Eurocrats. How do you live this situation and how can this uh, more political and more flexible approach to enforcement um, go on without undermining the credibility uh, and the image of impartiality of the European Commission? Thank you, Mario. First of all, if, if the European Commission is not about um, enforcing the rules and uh, being the guardian of the treaty, there's no point of being a political commission. Then you, you, you become a political party. We are an institution with a very strong responsibility as far as implementing EU rules is concerned. Um, I see the risk you mentioned about introducing flexibility, uh, but we're not introducing it. We're making explicit what was already there in the treaties. And we need to strike, if you really want, you know, it, I'm very worried about the economic situation in Europe because even in this situation of very low oil prices, uh, very uh, 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 low uh, uh, banking rates, we are still not growing 4% a year, which normally would be the case in these uh, exceptional uh, conditions. So we have a lot of reform to do. So. We need to strike a balance between uh, fiscal uh, discipline, 
structural reform and investment. Now, this commission is the first thing we did was to try and get investment to a much higher level. I think we've succeeded. We're now waiting for good projects because many, many public authorities have lost the taste of big projects uh, in, in these uh, crisis years, but we need big projects that will take the European economy into uh, uh, the next uh, revolution, which is the circular economy. We need these things very quickly. Um, but we also need to stay firm with member states on fiscal uh, discipline. And it will not do for member states, uh, some of uh, which you know very well, to simply say to the Commission, we will send you our plans, and if you don't like them, we will send them again. Uh, the Commission will have to mm -hmm. enforce these rules. And, and you know, you've seen uh, the row with, with Spain over the last uh, week. I'm very sorry. The Commission is just enforcing the rules. It's just saying what we've agreed at the European level. And even if this leads to rows, we will continue doing this. By the way, we have also stepped up our infringement procedures against member states who don't apply the rules because there's been, in the last couple of years, the feeling that we, because of the crisis, have become less strict also in enforcing the rules. And uh, also migration, we have stepped up um, uh, usually our infringement procedures against, against member uh, states. And, well, look at what we are trying to do to uh, uh, combat fiscal dumping. Who would have thought uh, a few months ago that we could use the state aid uh, instrument to also go after member states who um, engage in fiscal dumping, some of which, whom I know quite well. <laughs> Thank you. Giles Merritt, please. Yes. Um, a follow-up, uh, Mr. Timmermans, to Mario Monti's question on policy. Um, what is the Commission doing on analyzing and defining the problem? The, the last few months have been chaotic. The statistics are confusing and most of them very unreliable. So, first question, has the Commission got a hold of this? And is he going to put out, within a reasonably short space of time, a clear analysis of how many migrants there are? Because so far all we've really seen is the Commission on burden sharing quotas and so on. Second question, which comes back a bit to Mario's question, when are we going to see the Commission outlining something that looks like a longer term strategy? because most of us don't think that this crisis is going to stop at the end of this year. Well, I, let's be very clear. This crisis is going to be with us for at least a generation. This continent has gone, gone from being a continent of departure to becoming a continent of arrival, but this has not yet settled in our collecti collective psyche. So we need to get used to the fact that this continent, for good reason, has become a continent of arrival. Look at our de demographic development. It's not a bad development. It's a positive development if you're able to manage it. Um, of course, the Commission will put forward, uh, as we've announced, a number of proposals for structural um, handling of the issue. Uh, I think the, the um, uh, in emergency situations, uh, the reallocation of refugees should be a structural measure, not just a, a one-off. Not all member states agree, and I say this uh, with a little sense of irony, not all agree, but I think this is the direction uh, we need to go. We need to have a much better functioning uh, system of legal migration. Um, legal migration will be, have to be an element of solving the issue so that less people feel the need to abuse the asylum uh, uh, system. We need to have, to have, I have to say frankly, a tougher stance with some third countries about taking their nationals back who don't have the right to asylum. We need, we are, one of the reasons why the European public distrust us with asylum policy is that, first of all, a too high percentage of people abuse the asylum system, and secondly, those who are caught abusing it are not really sent back to where they come from. So we need, if you really want to do something about refugees in the long term, you need to make sure that less people abuse the system and more people return to the countries of origin. <coughs> and I'm afraid to do that, we will have to take a tougher stance with certain third countries. We need European uh, 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 border protection. We need to do better at that. We need to protect our external border in a better way. And I believe we need a European Coast Guard for that. So those are proposals 
we will uh, put on the table to create a more uh, to to provide a more structural answer to this issue but the worst thing we could do is to present a picture to the european population if we take these measures and i mentioned resettlement before but if we take all these measures this whole thing will stop it's not going to stop we need to prepare we need to have the courage to prepare our population for the fact that migration and some refugee crises will be with us for a long time to come thank you very much please Good morning. Uh, my name is Stefan Phil, a former uh, commissioner. Um, the European Union at the current stage is a union of member states. Whenever there is a bad weather or some challenges, the first sense is uh, to approach this issue at the national level. Uh, uh, the financial crisis has shown it and the migration has exposed it. Uh, so how to tackle this dilemma? That on one side, we created the impression that we have the EU policy instruments, institutions to tackle the challenges to Europe. But on the side, those are the member states delivering, implementing. And at the time of the crisis and bad weather, the record shows it's actually not, not enough. Thank you. Well, I think well, this is almost a philosophical question. I think given the last, the urgencies of the last, let's say, 30 years, 26, 27 years, the reasons why we took the steps we took, and I think were necessary, the speed with which Europe enlarged, the speed with which we went in other policy directions, have prevented us from having a collective debate on what is actually the nature of Europe. How do you see Europe? Um, you know, the, the, the very fact that David Cameron insists so much on, I want ever closer union to be removed from, from the treaty, uh, whatever you might think of the merits of this of this uh, 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 request, shows that he actually is asking for a debate about how do member states see our collective European future. And I think because of the urgencies, we did take the time, also not with the new member states, Stefan, to actually see what, what do you see as European destiny in this. And, and I think we are coming from different positions. Somebody in Germany and in France has a different perspective on this than somebody in, in, in the UK or somebody in, in the Czech Republic or, or, or elsewhere. And I, and I believe it's high time that we would find the courage to have a debate about this. Um, uh, because as long as we don't have a debate about this, we leave national politicians, we leave all the room for people to create their own uh, idea. And, and then, and then um, uh, uh, Europe uh, in, in many member states becomes sort of um, um, the um, detergent you put out of the cupboard when you have a problem and you put it in the washing machine but, and then you put it back in, in the cupboard. That Europe comes with advantages and disadvantages is something we will have to face uh, collectively. Uh, and and you, I, I think we would not be facing this level of crisis in the Balkans today with the refugees if uh, Hungary had not gone down the road of selfishly just putting fences across its borders. And at the end of the day, this is not uh, in, Hungary's, uh, in Hungary's interest to do it that way. I think they'll find out, but at what expense is it necessary to go through all of that? Thank you very much. Please, lady over there, yes. Hello, my name is Anna Terron, and for that discussion, let me introduce myself by saying that I have been State Secretary of Migration in the Spanish government. Um, 16 years ago, the Commission published a paper saying that in order to guarantee freedom of movement, security, and the application of our values, we had to complete this space of security, justice, and freedom. And we needed a common policy of migration and a common policy of asylum. So uh, we don't have it. We are living a crisis, but it's not an unexpected crisis. We knew since many, many years ago that a part of the system we would need to tackle such a situation was not existing, and we know at least since five years ago that there is a serious crisis and a serious situation uh, around Europe in the Mediterranean. Anna, could, uh, you, could you ask your question, please? Yes, I please. go to the question Thank you. immediately. Uh, we know what do we have to do. We know Dublin is not working, 
And we know that the leadership for going ahead is not going to come from the Interior Affairs Council of Ministers. Uh, we need to gather stakeholders in order to move on because as you said, and thank you for your words, otherwise um, we will go back. Uh, how the Commission think that that can be done in the nearly future, and do you think that you can lead this process, and by the process I mean to complete this a space of freedom, justice, and security? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we will certainly try, and we've done so, I think, in the last couple of months. Um, you know, it, it's always the Commission's proposals that are the basis for debate, and very often they are also the basis for conclusions. Um, so we will keep uh, uh, pushing uh, for that. And the, the complexity of the issue is not the, inv the individual measures we know we need to take. Uh, and Spain has some interesting experiences there in dealing with the refugees and the uh, crisis or the... Uh, the dealings with third countries that were very successful and we can learn from that and profit from that. The complexity is not in the individual measures. The complexity is in the fact that you need to take all these measures swiftly, all at the same time, with different competences. Some European, very limited, unfortunately, many national, some subnational, some even at the level of, of, of municipalities. Uh, so the, the, the challenge here is not the complexity of the content of the individual measures, the challenge here is really governance. How do you get this adopted and implemented at all these levels in 28 different member states, uh, and then again with all these countries surrounding us uh, at the same time? And that will be the biggest challenge in the next uh, uh, couple of months. And, you know, I, I went to Turkey last week uh, um, to see if we can come to terms with Turkey on an action plan to handle this uh, uh, together, and then I, I'm also incredibly um, surprised by the criticism you then get. You, the same people saying you should not have an agreement with Turkey are saying all these refugees should stay in Turkey. Well, yeah, uh, how do you want this to happen if you don't have an agreement with Turkey? So, you know, um, uh, we will need to face the fact that we cannot begin to solve this issue with the Syrian refugees without the Turks, and the Turks are very conscious of the fact that they cannot solve this without the European Union. So there is here a, um, uh, a basis for, for understanding. And all these things need to be done immediately. And, and the, the, the big problem of European governance in general, not just in the refugee crisis, is that the speed of governance, the speed of lawmaking, the speed of decision making is completely out of sync with the speed in which society changes which I think is the biggest speed in human history, certainly in Europe. So if we, we, we and that's why we're losing uh, many of our voters, because what they see is society changing so much and governance not being able to manage that change or to steer that change because we are so much slower than what is happening out there. And that applies to refugees, to international security, uh, to um, uh, 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 economic uh, transformation, to the energy issue, if we're not very careful, we're always too slow. And then people start blaming democracy for being too slow and pointing to uh, uh, autocratic leaders elsewhere in the world saying, hey, at least they do something. And, and, and that is really, I think, a fundamental challenge to the way our society is organized. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, over there, please. Yes. Uh, may I just say, I'm not going to be able to take all questions, but the conversation does not stop at 10.15 when Mr. Timmermans leaves. Uh, there will be uh, room for, we will be talking until 11 o'clock, so please be patient with me, yeah. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you. My question is uh, rather simple, what to do about what you described. But uh, to define it more, more precisely, let me go through the, very briefly, the three stages. I, 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 uh, really, I won't have time to take three stages, no, sorry. No, 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 three points. Uh, very, very, very... Uh, you will have to be first, very brief. The, the first, absolutely. Okay. But what to do is no question. <laughs> the, the first thing is that uh, EU structures prove not to be sufficient to face the problems, Eurozone crisis, refugee crisis, and so on. Failure generates blame games, Greeks, lazy bastards, uh, Germans, Nazis, which create mistrust. And then mistrust presents another obstacle in moving in the right direction of further unification. So we're in a vicious circle. The question is, 
how to break it, who yeah. takes the lead. Okay. The Commission, in the way Mario Giles suggested, by promoting more systematic work to face the problems, or a more wide-ranging national appeal by leaders, just like the German Chancellor or the French President. This is what I would like to have your thoughts about yes. how to break this vicious, vicious circle. circle. Oh, I'm sorry, it will engage everyone, and, and not just people in politics, people in, in civil society. Oxfam has a, has a huge role uh, to play in this. I, 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 I received a delegation of filmmakers, uh, and they were pleading with the commission to take the lead because they felt they couldn't. Uh, and I said, well, we both need to do this. So I think there needs to, uh, we need to build on a sense of complicity between all walks of life and all elements of society who feel a responsibility for this. And the Commission will certainly want to lead on this, but if you look at the way our society sees governance, governance is no longer the exclusive right of government. Uh, even stronger, I would say, government is not really trusted with governance uh, by uh, many parts of our population. So if you want to create a new sense of uh, trust and, and confidence in governance, you need to get other people who are commenting on governance but are not part of governance to come into the fold, to take the responsibility, to be part of the debate. Uh, and that, I think, is part of the solution. We cannot do without leaders such as Merkel, who sticks her neck out in an incredible way, and others will follow that example. But we cannot do either with um, organizations, uh, NGOs, um, cult the cultural sector, sports, all these things that attract people's attention and that do have an influence on how people see uh, uh, their society, everyone needs to take part of the responsibility. In that sense, um, just as a quick sidestep, in that sense, the crisis of governance in international football has just a negative, just as a negative effect on trust of people in, in governance as the crisis in, in a government or in international government. Thank you. So I'm going to make a plea for responsible short questions. I can take three questions. I'll take the gentleman here, Zoe, and I'm going to take Afzal. And I'm sorry, but the conversation will continue. Uh, we just don't have time for more. But very short questions, please, here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Luke Bass, the European Director for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which has member states and NGO members. So we try to work in that spirit of uh, governance going beyond government. Um, I want to turn the crisis management discussion, which is uh, very important, to an opportunity uh, debate. And uh, if you look at the agenda that was just agreed in New York, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, right. I think that's a huge opportunity for Europe. It's a leadership opportunity. It's a breaking siloing, silos opportunity. Yes. And we would have a common project. So my question is, for Europe, because it's universal, these goals, what we will be doing in Europe and to strengthen our economies at the same time, and how we will take up our global responsibility. And to finalize, you're the coordinating uh, commissioner, the vice president, uh, to coordinate the sustainable development policies, which yes. is a huge opportunity. Yeah, I, huge great. opportunity because it's the first time that it has we at have that one. level and not in the environment commission. Absolutely. Mr. Timmons, if you could. Well, on, on the sustainable development goals, what is important here is that for the first time, it's not just about what we want the third world to do or other countries to do. Mm -hmm. It's also homework for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do now in the commission is to be very precise on what that homework entails for European policies. And one of the areas, without going into, into detail, one of the areas where this will become essential is the energy uh, uh, sector. And I believe that much of what we can really do in terms of creating a common sense of purpose, of really bringing about a sustainable economy, of going for a circular economy, of creating more jobs, will be linked with the energy sector in Europe in the next couple of years. How, if we can quicken the pace of moving towards sustainable energy, if we can reduce the dependency of individual member states on individual energy uh, providers, if we can build new grids uh, for the energy sector. I think this is one of the most promising areas where we can combine the need to create jobs and growth with the need to create transition to a sustainable economy, with the need to show that Europe means something f not just uh, for individual member states. Thank you. Zoe, please. Thank you. My name is Zoe Gamsantopoulou. I'm the former president of the Hellenic Parliament. My questions are very direct and very brief. Are you proud of the way the Commission handled the Greek problem this summer and so far? Yes. Why? You are? Yes. Okay. 
Why does the Commission insist that the Greek debt is sustainable when there's substantiated evidence and reports both by the Parliamentary Committee in Greece and the IMF that the debt is unsustainable? Why does the Commission does not support a debt auditing in Greece as provided in the European regulation for 72 of 2013? And why does the Commission not support the debate open since 2014 within the UN on debt restructuring and principles on debt restructuring and debt relief, relief principles which, by the way, have all been violated in the case of Greece. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'm very proud of the Commission and especially Jean-Claude Juncker's record on the Greek uh, crisis uh, this summer. We would not have had an agreement uh, with uh, uh, Greece had it not been for Jean-Claude's leadership and I'm very proud of that and I will take nothing back from that. Secondly, uh, the issue of debt relief. Now, we have an agreement with Greece. I think the whole issue will uh, be uh, seen in a different light if in a couple of months from now uh, Greece actually applies some of the structural reforms that are desperately necessary uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, all good and well to only talk about debt restructuring, but if we don't talk about the issue of the essential nature of some of the structural reforms, debt restructuring uh, will not help because you will create new debt while you're talking about debt restructuring. So there needs to be structural reform in the Greek economy, in the Greek governance, if we are to see a different nature of the debate on uh, uh, debt relief. Once you will have that first step set, my feeling is that in essential member states, the issue of debt relief will be seen in a different light. Uh, and I can't be more precise than that, I'm afraid. Uh, um, Mr. Davinio, I will give you the floor in a second. I just want to take one final... You want to come I in now? Oh, fine, I, I, I would like an answer to my question on why the Commission is not supporting uh, uh, implementing EU regulations on debt auditing and why the Commission is not supporting the UN debate on debt restructuring because there's another forum, an international forum where these things are being discussed and the Commission is pressuring member states to abstain claiming that the UN is not the appropriate forum. So I would like an answer on that. Uh, you got my answer. You, you, you are about your questions. I'm about my answers. You will have to deal with the answers as I gave them to you. I think the, the Commission has been very generous to Greece. The Commission has been very helpful to Greece. And once again, the debate about debt restructuring can only have a meaning once there are real, real structural reforms in Greece. And we're still waiting uh, for those. And I hope that Prime Minister Tsipras delivers on his promises. And then we can really have a debate about the other issues as well. Thank you. Mr. Devenu. I think going back to a, a comment that uh, Mr. Timmermans made a few minutes ago, relating to the paradox over the fact that overwhelmingly there is an opinion that member states cannot do it alone, so that the European project is still very strong and living. The statistics show that. And at the same time, same statistics show that people are unsatisfied with what is happening. So, the traditional paradox. But I would like to take it to Greece. It's a very fascinating story in relation to this. Mr. Tsipras, first time around, was elected on a program, which he got a big support for. Then we entered in the process of a negotiation, which ended up with a conclusion accepted by the Greek government, which was not, to, to use a British understatement, exactly in line with the program on which Mr. Tsipras was elected. These things happened. So a new election was called. And who won? Those who changed and who lost, and I'm sorry for you, madame, and who lost were those who wanted to continue on the initial line. So democracy spoke, and I think it's important for this audience to know this, is that basically the, com the necessity to have a common solution was what prevailed, 
and those who stick to the original program were those who failed. In terms of uh, dynamism, this is not an uninteresting story. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Tamir and Sufiullah, I'm going to take two questions together. Yes, and, and then uh, I'll take Afzal and then Suad. Uh, so, Afzal, please, quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice President Timmerman, would you agree with me that the issue we're dealing with is more than refugees? When someone like myself, who is a proud Brit, who is a proud Muslim, and a proud European, and too many people feel that I don't belong here. And if you couple this with the refugee issue, with the environment that we're in, with the cuts the local level people are feeling. Yeah, sorry, you have to be short the, now. This, yeah, the cuts that the local level are feeling, that it is absolutely vital there are sufficient resources so the local services yeah. are handled properly. Yeah, thank you very much, Suad. Thank you very much, Suad McKennett. Um, I'm a young European leader and uh, a journalist for the Washington Post. I have covered the so-called refugee crisis issue, what you want to call it, uh, for the last couple of weeks. And I'm wondering, it seems to me that there is a little gap between what's happening on the ground, actually, and also the fears of people in Europe and some of the this parts of the discussion I'm hearing here today. And I was wondering, Mr. Timmermans, um, how do you actually want to address the fears uh, that people are having? How do you want to address the issue? And now we're talking about words. When you say we're talking about Syrian refugees, how do you want to address the fact that even the German Minister of Interior says that at least 30%, if not even more, of people who claim to be Syrian are not Syrian? Right. How do you want to address the fact that there are people traveling from other countries? So if you want countries? an answer, you'll have to, you'll yeah, have to stop there. This is an, just the last question. The fact that are people traveling to Turkey um, who are not Syrian, who destroy right. their passports and then just take the path on with the Syrian refugees and try to reach Europe. So I'm wondering how are you going to address all these right. fears of people? Right, thanks, Swat. Yeah. On, on the first issue, um, how is it possible that part of the young generation born in your country, my country, etc., can be mesmerized inspired, um, uh, recruited by a death cult. How is it that they can make, the death cult can make them dream and we cannot? Is that not a fundamental question for this society? How is it that we're losing part of our immigrant, or well, they're not even immigrants by any definition, part of our minority uh, populations to these uh, death cuts. Uh, I think this is a fundamental challenge to our educational system, to our social system. How is it that we have second, third generation young people saying, I'm not wanted here, but there, I ask, they want me. They give me something to fight for, to th believe in. So we need to find ways of making every single European, whatever his or her background, dream about their future here. I teach, I used to teach at a, at a uh, briefly, uh, when being a member of parliament at, at, a, at a middle school in, in, in my country with many immigrant children. And one, my first question was always, what do you dream about? And there was shock on the faces of the children. Nobody had ever asked them what they dream about. And I think we have a serious challenge in our civic system, in our educational system, if we cannot if we are not able to make our children, whatever their background is, dream about the future in our society and not be susceptible to, to be um, allured into, into an ideology that does let them dream about, about things they believe are, are good and right. Um, on on your, your question, it is absolutely clear that people try to abuse uh, uh, the system. And it is absolutely clear that we need to find some answers for that. It is absolutely clear that some countries now believe they can offload their Afghani refugees on Europe because it's working so nicely now with this uh, uh, refugee uh, uh, crisis. So we will have to do much better in protecting our external borders, in fingerprinting people 
immediately when they arrive in making a distinction between people who deserve asylum and people who don't, and people who don't will have to be returned where they come from. There is no other answer to this. And it's all very well and easy to have other answers when you're on an island somewhere in, uh, in, in the Pacific or on a different continent. But fences will not help. Um, other ways of approaching this will not help. This is the only way forward. And we're not doing this because for too long, member states had, who, where people arrived had been complaining about the fact that they were left alone. And then, you know, they stopped doing what they needed to do under Dublin, which is something I have some understanding for if you're abandoned for such a long time. So then what, what, what happened was that the red carpet was rolled out over the Alps and people came in without registration. Once, you know, this is a connected world. Once people elsewhere in the world see that this is an easy way into Europe, not only refugees will come into Europe. Let's not be naive about this. Not everyone coming into Europe is a refugee fleeing from war and persecution. But what we see the populist parties do, turn the argument around and say, because some of the people arriving are not refugees, we need to keep all of them out, is something I will fight against uh, until uh, uh, the last moment of my public responsibilities. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Timmermans. Mr. Devignon, would you like to just say a few words and then uh, we'll continue with the other conversation? I know you have to leave, but I have two important points on which I would like to have your, your, your reaction. The first point, we've spoken a lot about refugees. Supposing, unfortunately, that the capacity of finding a solution inside the institutions is difficult, does not meet the challenge, are we ready to do it amongst the countries who are ready to do it? Very complicated question, but I think we might come to that at one, at one moment, because not giving an answer leads to my second question. I think what you said was extremely important, is that now we have to find out, do we have a common project globally? at the European level, not in relation to item A, B, C, or D. Do we still have? And I think the request by the British in relation to getting rid of an ever closer union obliges us to raise this question. And in my view, it will become clear that it may not deal with the whole 28 countries agreeing on this. And then we will have to look at what it means and not decide that we can't do anything before 2017 because this is a theoretical taboo. You don't touch anything legally or constitutionally till 2017. But if you don't have a, 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 constitu a, a constituency or you lose your constituency with the risk of losing the project, Maybe we will have to revisit that also. Well, I would, I would see the last question as a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> um, on, on, on the first issue, I think every single member state deserves solidarity on this, and I think there should be no... Um, we should do everything to avoid having to go into a different composition of those providing answers because I believe that if we abandon the idea of doing this at 28 those who are willing to do this will quickly lose the constituency at home to do it because people the voters will tell them hey you're allowing these other countries to be free riders then we want to be free riders as well so I think if we really if we're serious about finding a solution we have to do everything to keep every single member state on board because if we don't the issue of trying to become free rider will infect not just the relationship between member states, but especially the relationship between uh, people in government in member states and their constituents. And they will be put under pressure in an already difficult time uh, not to take responsibility because others are not taking responsibility. So I'm afraid we're in this together. 
We are indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Timmermans, for taking such a wide range of questions, answering each one in detail. It was a great pleasure to listen to you. Many of the issues you've raised, sir, are going to be discussed during the day. So people who feel frustrated and angry with me because I didn't take your questions, I'm a bad girl and I should be punished, uh, you will have ample time to do this in the discussion that follows just now and during the day. So please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Timmermans.